evening. I am Rabbi Julia Weiss from Congregation Orami. On behalf of the USC Kazan Institute Valley Outreach Synagogue and Congregation Orami, we are proud to bring you the first of a two-part series, a discussion on the film 13th. This is the first of many joint efforts for our community working to bring you anti-racist education. It is an honor to introduce you to someone, a teacher, a mentor, and a friend, Dr. Joshua Holo, who is Dean of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion Skirball campus in Los Angeles, and Associate Professor of Jewish History. He founded the College Institute's digital learning platform and founded a neighborhood religious leadership coalition, including Christians, Muslims, and Jews in the University Park and West Adams area of Los Angeles. In the words of his friend and Valley Outreach Board member, Kiyomi Kowalski, when you sit at the Passover table with Josh, as I have done for years, you will talk about social justice with him. It is who he is. So thank you, Kiyomi, for inviting Josh to be with us, someone who lives out his commitment to anti-racial education, as all of you will witness tonight. Dr. Holo, welcome. You're honored you are here, Kiyomi. Thank you, Rabbi Julia. This is an incredible evening. Get ready. Um, Josh is a friend and a just an all around scholar and amazing individual. And um, I will be uh, helping him with questions tonight. So as you all have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box and I will uh, filter them to Josh. He will give you moments to, um, to ask them as he's, as he's presenting. Go ahead and do that. And uh, away we go. Dr. Josh. <laughs> Thank you, Kiyomi, for uh, inviting me to this opportunity to share conversation about such an important topic for all of us and with really important and specific concerns about our community, the Jewish community, as we confront this fast-changing world with very, very high stakes for living our values. And Kiyomi is my friend in that conversation now for the better part of a decade, as I recall. And it's always a pleasure to spend time with you. And I'm really honored that you asked me to come join this program. And to my former student, uh, Julie Weiss, the, Ju the Jewish tradition knows that you're never a former student. You're always my student. And that is for me a source of great pride as you and I get to have our paths cross uh, in your rabbinate at Ora Mead with our friend Paul Kipnis, it's such an amazing community. Uh, from the heart, it is an honor to be um, sharing this, this uh, presentation with you. And of course, to Ora Mead itself and to Valley Outreach Synagogue and the USC Kasdan Institute, co-sponsors and organizers of this, uh, thank you all. And um, here's to what I hope will be a lively conversation. Before I share the screen, I want to share with you my perspective. I think it's always very important uh, for presenters to reveal their biases and their approaches so that people who listen to us can understand how we're making our claims and also how you can push back against those claims if you disagree or if you wanna question them um, so that you can do it knowing that I too am aware of my own preferences and orientations and that they deserve to be challenged sometimes. So let's have a lively conversation. I'll try to make sure we leave plenty of time uh, for, for com comments and questions. And I will break in the middle of one of the section breaks to make sure that you have the opportunity to ask as we're going as well. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, ask your patience while I share my screen and begin our conversation, which starts, as you all know, with the movie 13th as the centerpiece for our conversation. The movie itself does not touch on the Jewish community at all, as far as I recall, but it poses questions that I think are very fertile and also very challenging for the Jewish community as we reorient ourselves to a new movement for civil and human rights in the black community in this country and beyond, but certainly primarily in the black community, uh, as Jews. We do this as a Jewish community to put our values into practice, and I think it requires a lot of thought. And I'm an historian, so I will bring the perspective of the historian to this conversation in the hopes that understanding our past will help enrich and activate our future. 
So let's begin where we begin, which is the movie 13th. And I would like to argue that the main proposition of the movie itself is the following. The 13th Amendment has a loophole. Whereas we think of the 13th Amendment as the moment of emancipation, first of all, we know that emancipation actually was a process that took not days, not weeks, not months, but even years to really kick in. That's emancipation. Forget Jim Crow and forget civil rights, just emancipation. But let's leave that aside, because what DuVernay is arguing in her movie 13th is that despite claiming the space in our historical imagination as Americans of the moment of emancipation, there is in fact a loophole that has dug in and prevented emancipation from becoming a full-blown reality for the black community in this country. And here's her argument. The 13th Amendment reads as we see right here, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. DuVernay argues that the clause, except as punishment for crime, is the loophole. And the way she interprets it over the course of the movie is that if you have no slavery, except for crimes where you can be held against your will, which is a kind of slavery in the argument of the movie, then, then this crime becomes the opportunity to enslave you effectively or to uh, preserve a vestige of slavery. And so for her, the loophole is criminalization of the black community effectively preserves a form of slavery. That's how I read her argument. So we take this argument and we ask ourselves as a Jewish community, how do we intersect with that understanding of the black experience in America? How do we take that understanding of our past experience and move it forward for a new reality shoulder to shoulder as allies with the black community in the ongoing unfinished work of justice. I think there are two major streams looking historically and sociologically that we need to understand. Number one is our sources of empathy. It is one of the great elements of being Jewish in America that we have a deep, powerful, beautiful, articulate um, expression of empathy, not only for African-Americans, but indeed for all oppressed peoples. I think, however, it is also true that the American Jewish experience, broadly speaking, faces challenges of identification with oppressed peoples and with black America in general. I think it's really important for us to appreciate our sources of empathy and to confront the challenges of identification so that we can get past them. So let's start with the sources of empathy. Before we do that though, I'm gonna pause. This is the introductory component. I'm setting up this story that I wanna take you on with me, uh, but I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of clarity or any pressing questions before I move on. Kiyomi, how are we doing? We're doing, we're doing okay. I asked for clarification on a question um, from Bryn Harari, but um, maybe you understand. Can you talk about the progress made through education and prevention slash intervention with the minority population over the past 30 years? I asked for some elaboration, but um, perhaps you understand. She said yeah, that, that the movie didn't touch on that point. Yeah, indeed, indeed, the movie didn't touch on it. And it may come across to many that the movie has uh, an edge of pessimism to it. I think um, that maybe this questioner is picking up on, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, that there are, there are major uh, 
steps in education of the American populace that hopefully have changed people's perspectives for the better, but maybe we don't see that in the movie. I'm not sure. Uh, I'd have to think about what, you know, the degree to which I agree or disagree. Um, so I'm going to have to shelve the question and we'll move on and talk about the Jewish perspective, which I hope will prove fertile. So Hopefully she'll elaborate. And uh, the next question was, um, someone's asking, um, how can we say that Jews have great powers of empathy when certain um, people um, in power um, are Jews and aren't quite showing and displaying that empathy? Uh, good question. Uh, I wish that all Jews and all human beings lived up to their best selves. And I wish that we only drew on the positive parts of our tradition. But the truth is that we are uh, in our humanity fallible, but also in our tradition. We have ugliness in our tradition as well, which we have to confront. So um, unfortunately, our work, as we're going to arrive at, is not simply to take our tradition and say, how beautiful, how perfect, we're perfect. No. Our work is to say, I choose. I choose to accept and develop the best of my tradition to demand the best of myself. Not everybody will necessarily make that choice, but that is our work. And that is what I hope we can do together. So let's find what those sources are of empathy so that we can use them and draw on them, but not use them as a crutch. So let's go with our sources of empathy. The first one is the one that is best known to all of us. And I ask you rhetorically, since I don't have the time to actually take a vote, how many of you at your uh, Seder table, uh, Kiyomi introduced me in terms of, or, or Rabbi Weiss introduced me in terms of my uh, Seders with uh, Kiyomi, how many of you sing the spiritual Go Down Moses at your Seder table, right, Kiyomi? Did I do that. I suspect a lot of you are raising your hands at the screen right now. The truth is that it this, this memory of historical friends specifically of slavery, is very embedded into our consciousness. In fact, the Passover Seder is one of the most enduring Jewish rituals, even for Jews who have otherwise assimilated. The Passover Seder also is one of those events in American Jewish life that is most likely to include non-Jews around the table. There is something powerful about the story of slavery that Judaism has chosen to internalize, has chosen to foreground. And so the best and most eloquent version of this, in my mind, is Exodus 23, 7, but it's repeated 36 times in Torah, a version of this. You shall not oppress a stranger because you grasp the personhood, the humanity, the nefesh, the soul of the stranger, of the person who otherwise doesn't seem like you, you grasp their shared humanity despite the fact that they don't seem like you on the outside because you yourselves were strangers in the land of Egypt. We were slaves and we were freed for a reason. We were slaves and we were freed so that it would elevate our human condition. Now, that we don't always live up to that, fair enough. We'll talk about that. But that is certainly one of the great messages of Judaism. We don't just have a shared memory of slavery. We also have a shared experience in recent history. And now... From the historical perspective, which is my job, I join some of you on this call who actually are now in living memory. Some of you on this call actually remember a world that looked a little bit like the signs that I've shown you here in this illustration on the left. These are real signs that show American, aggressive, violent, exclusionary, racist, anti-Semitic tendencies throughout much of American history, regardless of North and South. This is important that we remember, East, West, North, South, this is not just a Southern problem. One of the ones that I uh, hear you can see Spanish or Mexicans as well, which has to do with the West as well as parts of the South. 
And we all know, I think most Jews were raised on the knowledge that uh, Henry Ford was a virulent anti-Semite. And he, uh, his Dearborn Independent, the, uh, the, the newsletter, the newspaper that he uh, owned and, and, and funded, uh, one of its most famous headlines is right here, the international Jews, the world's problem. So spewing much of the classic anti-Semitism, which was part and parcel of uh, an early 20th century America and really mid and in some cases late 20th century America that um, ate and drank and slept some of the most, uh, the ugliest expressions of racial anti-Semitic uh, um, uh, hatred. It is also true that in the emergence from this wave of oppression, meaning the middle of the 20th century, uh, kicked off not specifically but broadly by Brown versus Board of Education. Yes, kill me. I can't hear you. People are not seeing the slides changing for some reason. Um, can we? I Let's see. want to reshare your screen. I, it looks like we're you, you're still sharing. Can you? What can you see, Kim? There, I saw your screen um, going through the whole time, but uh, there's some people who are not seeing. Uh, actually, there's quite a few people, so I, I take it that we're frozen on the pyramids screen. Uh, I have shared again. Is that okay. helping? Um, I hope so. Let's see here. I'm now moving from shared experience to shared struggle. These are the two slides I'm going back and forth between right now. I just ask if it's fixed. Oh, yes, we're fixed. Oh, great. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you for telling. Thank you. Thank you for raising your hand. So we move now to shared struggle. This is really important because the Jewish, again, living memory, now we're moving even closer to our own experience, although I wasn't born at this point, and many of you, I'm sure, on, the, on this call had not been born, but we are raised in the Jewish community to remember Mickey Schwarmer, Schwarmer, uh, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney, who died together uh, in, uh, in a push for voting in Mississippi. It was the basis for the movie Mississippi Burning, also a movie that my generation knows very well. And, uh, and Schwarmer and Goodman were Jewish. And they were known to be Jewish, and, and it was part of, part of the story of civil rights. So we begin to have skin in the game, so to speak. We're really invested in this um, great leap forward that we call today civil rights. And most famously, most of all, yeah, we have a problem? Yeah, something's happening where we're only seeing you as a speaker. Um, let me see. I'm sorry, Josh. No, it's okay. Um, let me see. Matt, is there a way that we can... It, okay. It's, Maybe it's, it's slow. It's being fixed. Something, it might be running slow, you all. Um, we have quite a few viewers tonight. Um, just uh, be patient and bear with us. Thank you, Josh. Let me find myself again here. Forgive me. Here we are. So we're moving from shared struggle and that particular moment that captured the imagination of America when uh, the voting rights push uh, resulted in the murder of these young men, two of whom were Jewish, to shared purpose. And now, soon, I hope you will all see an iconic photograph of Martin Luther King Jr. and Abraham Joshua Heschel standing together in Selma, Alabama, um, at the uh, famous 1965 march. And of this, again, many of us are raised on these words in the Jewish community. Abraham Joshua Heschel famously said, even without words, our march was worship. I felt my legs were praying. For those of you who are joining us from Valley Outreach Synagogue, I am a Valley boy, and I grew up, and I went to school at Abraham Joshua Heschel Day School. So these kinds of things are part of the way many of us were raised. This is really key to our identity. So these are just some of the historical sources of empathy, the wellspring of compassion, 
that we have at our at our disposal as Jews and that we tend indeed to use, I think, when we are calling on our best selves. Uh, and this is the sort of the historical look that I bring to it with my own bias as an historian. At this stage, I'd like to offer the opportunity to ask questions uh, before I move on to the challenging part. I'm not sure there's a question here. A, a critical mass of legal aid lawyers, over 75% in Mississippi during uh, Freedom Summer, were Jewish. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Kathy. Yeah, Th those kinds of facts are, in, are, are real. They are, they are part of our story and our understanding. It is more complicated. Uh, the Jewish community during the 50s and 60s, probably more in the 50s, uh, struggled with the idea of um, of, of civil rights, and it wasn't always a no-brainer, and we didn't always draw on our deepest selves. By the way, one of the reasons Abraham Joshua Heschel was so important was he, be, he gave the Heckscher, he made it kosher to do that kind of work in a grand way. Some of us have been privileged to work with rabbis who did that work, like uh, Rabbi Richard Levy, my friend who passed away a year ago. Uh, and was in jail in St. Augustine and met Martin Luther King Jr. These are stories that we're raised with, um, really, really important ones. Uh, any other questions before? We have some really interesting audience members today. Um, one saying that uh, his uncle, Rabbi Sal Besser, marched with Martin Luther King to support civil rights. That's great. These are these are stories of our of our people. They are the sources of empathy that those of us who were not alive then, we still invoke these experiences to this very day, and and we should be proud of it. This is important. But we're going to get back to these sources of empathy in a minute. When Kiyom, if you give me the high sign, I'll move on. But if there's more, I'll wait. Okay. I'm going to move on to the challenging part because I think it's really, really important that we have a healthy respect for the challenges that we face as a Jewish community moving forward. Now, does anyone know who this is, this strange looking guy? This, to prove my point about the challenges of identification, is uh, Joseph Benjamin the treasurer of the Confederacy. He was Jewish and uh, he was uh, an example of how complicated it can be uh, to talk about uh, Jewish identification with the black struggle because he was, he was a Confederate leader uh, and uh, an important uh, figure in, in the Civil War on what we would call the wrong side. I want to go back now as a challenge to invert the meaning of historical suffering, because in some ways, it's a problem. On the one hand, I just quoted to you at the beginning of the talk, exactly the same quote, with even the same image, just to make it really easy. We got the pyramids here to make it clear. We're talking about slavery, the Israelite slavery in the land of Egypt. We know this back and forth. But if we read carefully the text, it says, you shall not oppress a stranger because you grasp the personhood, the humanity of the stranger, having yourselves been strangers in the land of Egypt. The perspective of this quote is not the perspective of the oppressed person. It is the perspective of a person who sees themselves as having overcome and moved past oppression to the point where they could even imagine themselves oppressing someone else. This is what I call the inversion of historical suffering. On the one hand, there is a beautiful ethical lesson here, which is when you achieve a, a level of safety and confidence and well being, you must remember with humility and generosity and human identification, you must remember when you weren't riding so high. However, we should pause right here to point out that this quote presupposes that we actually are 
kind of riding high. It's written at a time when it is understood that the, that the Jews, the Israelites, had power in the land of Israel, that they were the enfranchised population, and they are being exhorted not to abuse that power. But the whole point of the, of the quote is that they have power. This, in a, in, a, in, a, in a way, actually is a challenge to identification. It becomes the powerful person wanting to extend themselves, but not necessarily identifying with the oppressed person. Now, we're going to start getting into very complicated waters because we're going to start edging around this question of what it means for Jews to exercise and feel like they can afford to exercise power in American society today. This is right now we're pivoting to where the Jews have shifted from their understanding of empathy and partial identification with the oppressed and the black community to a reality in which we are both perceived and basically perceive ourselves to be enfranchised and empowered. We're going to f talk about what that means in a minute, but I just want to establish that with some evidence for you. The first one is the historical view that is my home ground when we look at the past and think about what it means for the Jewish historical experience. But this is a very recent statistic from the Pew Research uh, Institute, Research Center, excuse me, and it reports the following. Black adults in America are five times more likely to report unfair stops by the police, which is to say 44% of black adults, and by the way, it's higher if you're a black man. It's lower if you're a black woman, but that's the average. 44% of black adults report unfair stops, and only 9% of white adults report the same. That's five times difference. Now, what I want to argue here is that although to our credit, the Jewish community is changing in its demographic makeup, and we are no longer easily categorized as white in many ways. We have immigration from countries around the world that have Jewish populations of darker skin. We have intermarriage. We have conversion. Uh, and we have a whole demographic shift, but it's very slow. And still, the, ma the majority mentality of American Judaism is increasingly white. And if we understand that whiteness is not the color of your skin, but your position in relation to power and enfranchisement and autonomy in society, um, it, it is appropriate in many ways to argue as I would, although we can discuss this, that American Judaism is a white phenomenon for most American Jews, often independent of their skin color, often, but not always. I'm going to make a generalization for the, for the case of this argument that the Jewish community enjoys, by and large, the benefits of power, and that in this case, we have a white experience, but we'll get to that. It is also the case that we no longer identify with Duvernay's argument that criminalization of black America is the way in which society keeps oppressive power on top of the black community. That's Remember, that's Duvernay's argument. Now, originally in the 1900s, that was an argument that promoted actual identification. Now, it's different. I'm going to read an article, I'm sorry, from uh, Ishmael Reed, a famous African-American um, author, and something he wrote in Tablet uh, right here. It is a popular misconception that Jews and blacks began an alliance during the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s. 
In fact, that alliance began in the early 1900s when both groups faced brutality from New York police, mainly comprised of Irish cops, who went around punching out Jews who, quote unquote, looked Jewish. So the message here is that there was a time when Jews identified with precisely what Duvernay is arguing, that criminalization and state violence have kept black America oppressed despite the 13th Amendment, or in some ways, because the 13th Amendment continued to allow that to be the case. There was a time, despite the fact that they were never emancipated in America, they were in Europe, that the Jews nevertheless experienced the criminalization that we read right here. But surely, statistically, it is incumbent upon us to recognize that the Jewish community today is not a victim of this kind of criminalization. We don't suffer that experience, statistically speaking. And so we have to come to terms with the fact that despite our deep wellspring of empathy for, caring for, and amazing, in many ways, history, shoulder to shoulder with the black American struggle, this thesis, this argument of the movie 13th, that this clause, this loophole in the 13th Amendment effectively allowed the oppressive qualities of slavery to continue being thrust upon the black community by virtue of criminalization, right here where it says it, that that ingredient in oppression is not an ingredient, an ingredient in the American Jewish experience anymore. In fact, also from the Pew Research Center, roughly, as you can see, 50%, and this is constant from 2007 to 2014, meaning, let's say, in the first quarter of the 21st century, 50% of American Jews consider themselves white. And again, this isn't about your skin tone. This is about the white privilege that you get walking down the street. Not you individually, but that Jews statistically perceive themselves as getting, that they walk through the, the world as generically white. Now, there is no such thing as generic white. White is a very specific thing. But Jews generally feel that they have that benefit. What I want to argue for you today is the following. I want to argue that this statistic that I'm putting so prominently on your screen is in fact irrelevant because I would argue that most Jews, most of the time, and certainly our, the, the, the mentality of most Jews most of the time, is that even if they don't consider themselves white, they get the benefit of being white. They pass. They pass as white. So sociologically, fundamentally, most Jews get the benefit of being white no matter how they feel about themselves. Moreover, that their experience simply has diverged more and more from the black American experience. And we are now posed with a challenge, the challenge of this webinar, the challenge implicitly in the movie 13th, which is if the Jewish American experience no longer functions in the way of the imagined past of civil rights, if, there, if we're not subject to the violence, if we function as white people and we haven't an attitude not of being oppressed, but of being able to help the oppressed, God willing. How do we find shared purpose with the African American community? Shared purpose so that we, as citizens of this country and as human beings and as Jews, can advance the cause of justice, which we know is being violated all the time in this country. How do we find that sense of shared purpose? And I propose two steps. The first step is to abandon 
Jewish fragility. Now, what is Jewish fragility? Jewish fragility is our version of white fragility. And what is white fragility? It is the resistance that white people feel towards being called out for being complicit in, being the beneficiaries of, and being the 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 the, the um, uh, perpetrators of the, the the perpetuators of a fundamentally oppressively racist society. That even if you're individually not a racist or you don't perceive yourself to be a racist, you are if you are white, whatever that means, you are getting the benefit of racism. You are passively perpetrating it and and perpetuating it and advancing it. And that we have to do some serious work to undo that. White fragility is the resistance to that argument. Now, here's the key. White fragility comes from a place of decency. Nobody wants to be a racist. Nobody wants to be contributing to racist oppressive forces. Nobody wants to be on the wrong side of history. And so when we are confronted with what is effectively an accusation, Although sometimes people try to be nicer about it, sometimes people try to be more politic about it. White fragility kicks in and we're like, that's not true. That's not true at all. I'm not a racist, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's white fragility. Jewish fragility, regardless of whether or not you're white Jewish or not Jew white Jewish, if, because I'm arguing that you live your life as a white Jew anyway, for the most part, the most part, not every. That Jewish fragility is a little bit different. Here's what Jewish fragility is. Jewish fragility is when I tell you the story of what I have called in my chapter heading, the wellspring of empathy. That beautiful story of shared purpose with Abraham Joshua Heschel, with Martin Luther King Jr., with, with, uh, with, with uh, Schwerner and, and Goodman and Cheney going together to to, to promote voting in the South. These powerful, important stories, the destruction, the bomb in the temple in Atlanta, together with the, the destruction of black churches, all of these things. What I'm saying is Jewish fragility is our tendency to invoke that history as a crutch. It is our tendency to invoke that history as bona fides, as somehow claiming that we have a seat at the table on the side of justice. Now, I think history matters. It matters to me. It's what I do for a living. It's the way I view the world. But sometimes we use it as a crutch. And here's what I mean. If everybody has the slide, you see this example here that I have of Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman. But you have a quote. That's just a, the, the picture is not the point. The point is the quote. Uh, latest snow in the foreword wrote an article uh, about the movie by Duvernay also called Selma, and it's a story of Selma. And Latest Snow basically complains. She writes right here in front of you, the narrative strategy of the film, this is the film Selma, not 13th. The film Selma leads to a glaring omission that has not yet been, not yet surfaced. Namely, the contribution that thousands of white people, many of them Jewish, made to the civil rights movement. Here's my concern, and here's why I call it Jewish fragility. I think we should be hearing a message, and I say we here as a, a kind of an official Jew. I'm a Jew who has a career as a Jewish historian, who runs a Jewish organization, who trains Jewish leaders. I'm kind of organizational Jew. I'm a man, I pass as white, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, an organizational Jew. And what I'm saying is I love the wellspring of our Jewish empathy. It gives me the, will, the, the, the goosebumps. I feel warm and it, it motivates me. But if the film Selma has us out of it, if we are not part of that story, I do not think it's helpful for us to complain about that. I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense for us to say, but what about us? But what about us? We were there too. I think it's tone deaf to the brutality and the urgency of the struggle today. And we have to change our orientation. And I want to invite you to challenge yourselves to change our orientation, not 
to the implied self-justification of 50 years ago, but to rolling up our sleeves and looking in the mirror and going again shoulder to shoulder with our black brothers and sisters in particular, but all people of oppression, and to create a new story, not to recreate the 60s, but to reinvent the Jewish role in the pursuit of justice in the United States of America today. And this brings me to my second goal. First, I say, let us abandon Jewish fragility. There is history, there is a story there that's meaningful, but that story doesn't give us credibility. We have to earn our credibility again for today. And how do we do that? We dig deep into our tradition, and here I am an historian and a Jewish textualist, and I bring you just one example of many of that best part of our tradition that should be triggering the best part of ourselves to demand the highest forms of justice at our disposal. And now I quote Psalm 72, may the rule of your land judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May the ruler champion the cause of the poor among people, give deliverance to the needy and crush those who wrong them. I added, I didn't add it to the Torah, but I, I included crush those who wrong them. This is the work of anti-racism. This is specific. It's not enough for us to say, rah, rah, justice, justice. We have to work against the powers of injustice, especially when we participate in them. It's hard work. It's worthy work. And I look forward to thinking about it and getting there together with you for a shared future and a shared destiny um, that this country and all the people in it deserve. Thank you for the time and the attention. Thank you, Josh. Well, we have quite a few questions and I'm sure some more will in. Um, I'll start here. How do you suggest uh, to deal with those um, that when we recently saw the Black Lives Matter protests focused instead on the looting? It seems so similar to this time you just talked about. Um, sorry, you spoke about a time uh, of, uh, I, I'm wondering which time they were referring to, uh, but, uh, what do you say about the looting? Um, I have uh, two thoughts on that. My initial personal response is very clear. Uh, we have to distinguish between the looters and the protesters. As Americans and human beings, we have to support the protesters at all costs. As Americans, because that's the First Amendment, that's what uh, democracy is. And without it, there were without it, we're, we're dead in the water. And everybody needs that. Not just Black Lives Matter. Everybody, and especially Black Lives Matter today. And then to distinguish that between the looting and I personally am comfortable, absolutely. Um, um, disassociating with the looting and, and, and condemning it. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, shy about that. I do confront people uh, who argue that the looting is legitimate. Not many, but some who argue that there needs to be a violent awakening uh, to shake up the system because the system is too entrenched to wake up. Now, I get it. I hear that. Any historian will acknowledge that there are times when things happen because of violence. I'm not a pacifist, uh, strictly speaking. However, as an American, as an interested party, that's not my line, that's not my position. My position is to distinguish between them and to support the people uh, who do the work of, of American patriotism, which is to peacefully demonstrate and insist on justice. Okay. How does your uh, premise address the concept of cultural appropriation? Um, Jewish experiences are not the same as those of Blacks, are they? In the cultural appropriation term. Yeah, that's, I, I appreciate the question. It's a very fine distinction and a very important one. That's why you may have noticed I started off with the part that we do empathize, but we don't identify. In other words, uh, we have a wellspring of empathy whereby we can draw on our own pain, our own suffering, and that that should make us more sensitive to the suffering of others. Not to claim that our suffering is the same 
as others. And that's a very fine distinction, but I think it's very, very important. And I think any Jew must have, if you're of a certain age, you probably remember conversations where somebody made some comparison with their story of suffering to the Holocaust. And your natural reaction as a Jew is like, whoa, 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 wait a second, man. Like, okay, this country suffered a bad war and all that stuff, but that was not the Holocaust. The Holocaust was systematic murder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's like straight up American Jewish politics. We, we all were raised to believe that, and I, I still believe it. It's a, very, it's a very special kind of thing. And if somebody tries to identify with that, I'm going to resist them. However, if somebody says, my grandmother came from Ireland during the famine to America and kissed the ground and, you know, made a life and you know, faced all these challenges and all that, I'm going to say we have the capacity to empathize with one another as immigrant populations, as, as people who suffered certain types of, 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 um, of uh, discrimination, et cetera. And even if they suffer a war, and, they, and, and, and we can acknowledge that the violence of the Holocaust, the violence of the war, they're not the same thing, but they can sensitize us in ways that are empathic. That's good. Looking forward, we're not going to be able to identify so much anymore because our paths have diverged, so we have to re-up the work of shared values. Thank you. Um, many people, including your dad, uh, want you to uh, shout out Judah Benjamin. Judah Benjamin? <laughs> my dad wants me to shout out Judah. Okay, so Tell my Josh dad wants me to. His father says it is Judah Benjamin. <laughs> Judah Benjamin was a Sephardi Jew. Uh, he, and, and I am of Sephardi stock. My father uh, bequeathed to me proud Spanish Latino heritage. And uh, uh, Judah <laughs> Benjamin was, was of that. I believe Judah Benjamin, by the way, was of the. Caribbean uh, trajectory, whereas my dad and I are from the Turkish trajectory for another for another conversation. Uh, but it does touch, by the way, um, it does touch on Jews of color. You're looking at two Jews of color in front of you, Keo Mikowalski and arguably Joshua Holo, who you know is, I speak Portuguese at home. I I'm, I'm a Sephardic Jew of Spanish descent. What does whiteness and color mean? These are rich, complicated questions which deserve to be asked. Although I would argue that, at least in my case, I'll let Kiyomi speak for herself, I get the benefit of being white, even if I claim to be Latino. I, I could not have that benefit. <laughs> yeah. I myself I, I just would never say be afforded that. Right. <laughs> I think it's I, clear. I, I, I think everyone to... could tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the impact uh, that Jews have experienced by African-American leaders and institutions? Uh, I mean, that's a long story. I think um, Jews feel uh, deeply connected to Martin Luther King Jr. for all the right reasons that I think any sentient, politically minded human being feels connected to Martin Luther King Jr., the, the amazing, not unlike Gandhi. Um, I think Jews feel very wounded very hurt and very offended by Louis Farrakhan, for example. Um, and I think that that gets back to the Jewish fragility. I think that we are, we are offended because he's, he's frankly very offensive to the Jews. I, don't, I, he's, I mean, he's offensive, so there's a good reason to be offended. But, but there's another layer, which is that because we have that wellspring of empathy that I articulated in the first half of my talk, when we encounter black antagonism to us, it actually hurts our feelings because we feel connected and then to be to be told that we're, you know, we're no better than the white oppressor or whatever um, triggers our Jewish fragility in exactly the way I was trying to articulate before. Um, and we need to we need to examine that because uh, we're not going to be able to communicate effectively and productively to the black community if we don't grapple with what's going on. So someone has a question I, that uh, they've heard, this goes along with this, that uh, many uh, uh, Black Americans have anti-Semitic feelings against Jews um, and also against Israel. Is that true, was the way the question's phrased? Uh, I will not comment on the many part, um, mm -hmm. I, I, because I don't know the proportions. 
I really don't. And um, although my colleagues, among them is Bruce Phillips, one of the leading demographers of uh, Western Judaism and a scholar of the Black Jewish relationship, in many ways, he would be a wonderful guest for this show. Oh, yes. He's, he's amazing and he knows everything. Uh, an incredibly wonderful person. Bring um, him back next time. You, this is a two-parter, yeah, you know. There you go. Exactly. Uh, his name is Bruce Phillips from the Hebrew College. Um, uh, he might be able to say, I don't know if he has the data, on the proportions of Black America who um, hold uh, negative feelings towards Israel or towards Jews. However, I will say this. I have encountered it. I have encountered it. Um, in some liberation black bookstores in the south side of Chicago. I've encountered it with the Black Lives Matter uh, leadership statements periodically as I've come out. I think it would be unreasonable for us to deny that it exists. I do not think that we as a Jewish community have fashioned a really well thought out and effective way to overcome it to create a conversation whereby we, we express a, uh, a presence in the black community that contradicts those negative feelings about Israel or about Jews. I think we have a lot of work in that regard. Um, but I'm also aware of the amazing allies that I have. Um, Reverend John Cager, my friend and colleague and neighbor at Ward AME and other of black leaders in the Los Angeles area, at least of them, among them Mayor Tom Bradley, by the way, himself, who forged a black Jewish alliance. There's a lot of positive stuff that we can work with that is forward looking. Um, would a, sure, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, Sharedi, Sharedi Jew agree Haredi, that there, yeah. Haredi, excuse me, would they agree that there is not oppression because of looks today for Jews, um, both in Israel and America? Um, if the Haredi Jew in question, uh, it depends what they wear, frankly, uh, they also can pass if they choose. Um, and so, uh, and, and sometimes they do, by the way, sometimes they tuck the earlocks behind their ear, they put on a, 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 a nondescript cap and they can, wear, you know, so, that, so remember passing is not strictly speaking, your physiology. It's your ability to use your physio physiology to manipulate your place in society. It's just at your disposal or it's not. Either you can pass or you can't. Haredi Jews can pass, just like I can. However, um, it is true, I suspect, and this is from personal conversations, but I don't have a lot of you know sociological data, that Haredi Jews do understand that if they choose to go out in recognizably Haredi, this is ultra-Orthodox garb, mm -hmm. that they are putting themselves at risk in certain, co in certain neighborhoods and that they are, um, they are promoting certain stereotypes that will harm them or at least could harm them. Um, and I think that they feel that there probably requires some courage and some faith to go about your life um, uh, consciously putting yourself out there like that. So I suspect they would help us complicate the problem. What happens if we are rejected by the same people we want to join in struggle because we also identify with Israel's struggles to exist and find its um, own moral compass? It's a great question. I think it is probably the single most pressing question for I strongly identifying proud Zionist progressive Jews today. And here I speak as a proudly identifying Zionist progressive Jew myself. That's how I pigeonhole myself. And it is extremely difficult. I think it requires a lot of knowledge about Zionism and about the current Israeli situation and uh, a lot of civic open-heartedness for us to engage in conversation with people who may be suspicious of where we're coming from. Uh, and that, that requires a certain amount of thick skin and a willingness to wade into difficult conversations. It is one of my public teaching missions, which I spend a lot of time on, to articulate a progressive Zionist vision that um, undercuts the, um, the distaste with Israel that many people feel. 
um, because that distaste sometimes bleeds into claims against Israel altogether. My position is to be a proud Zionist and to talk about the rationale for the state of Israel as an idea and as a place and to bifurcate that and separate that from the policies of Israel with which I disagree personally because I'm a Zionist, progressive, strongly identifying Jew. So forgive me if I spoke in circles a little bit there. I just want to acknowledge that it's really, really difficult. It can be done if you take the time to have the relationships and the slow, thoughtful conversations that we need. Um, let's see here. How do you explain um, that some pre-Civil War rabbis supported slavery? So early on, uh, I got a question. I think it was the first question of the evening mm -hmm. that spoke about the fact that um, how can we talk about Jewish um, empathy when we have people, Jews in the White House, who are, um, uh, who are executing policies that are very unempathic, shall we say? Um, and I, re I responded, you may recall, that it is not for us to celebrate a glorious tradition in a one-dimensional way, as if, you know, Judaism is perfect the way it is, and I'm perfect because I'm just a really happy Jew. But that won't cut it. It shouldn't cut it, because that's, that's moral laziness. That's not moral action and moral growth and moral edification. Here's the answer to the question. We, as Jews, have always chosen those aspects of the religious tradition that we choose to emphasize, and we have chosen to background others. So it is true that if you want to justify slavery and you are an antebellum rabbi in the South, you can very readily quote both biblical and post-biblical sources from the entire length of the Jewish tradition that not only justify, but regulate and therefore normalize slavery. You can do that. And if you want to, I cannot tell you that you're a bad Jew or you're faking it or you're, I just can't because it's there. But here's what I will tell you. I want to promote among all of us the active moral agency of choosing. I choose to identify with the requirements to be caring, with the requirements to share, with the requirements to see the divine spark in every human being who has that right, that God-given right to be seen as a full dimensional human being simply by virtue of being born a human being. That's it. These are all embedded in the Jewish tradition alongside the traditions of slavery. And I choose those passages, those commandments, those requirements that stretch me to being a better human being, a better citizen, and a better Jew as I see it. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, one is certainly along the lines of the Black Lives Matter um, uh, movement. Uh, it, the premise is that uh, BLM, some of BLM believes uh, that it, Israel perpetrates a genocide against Palestinians. How do we reconcile this with joining the Black, Matter, Black Lives Matter efforts? I believe you touched on this before. Um, but uh, would you want to address this? I would, I would resist the word genocide, not because of the Holocaust, but because of the word itself. Um, I, think, I think we have to articulate a capacity to hear arguments that are coherent, that charge the state of Israel with real harm against the Palestinians, real damage, real pain, real violence, real death, the whole thing. And that we need to be able to say that and at the same time distinguish between genocide and that. I think there are different, different orders of magnitude and different things are going on. Um, and I think we should be able to talk about that, but we can't afford to get too defensive about it because people will then say that you're just being defensive. You have to be very artful. And that requires a lot of knowledge, but also a lot of patience. 
Let's see. One. Um, let's see. We've got two more here. Um, DiVernay in 13th outlines the history of the systems that have been put into place to subjugate Black Americans. They have been forged into our American culture. How do we break those implicit and explicit biases as a greater community and bring about the changes that need to happen? Um, it's that big, is it's the a big question. question. Yeah, yeah, it's a right? sort of, it's sort of the, quiz, the question yeah. of the evening. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I. I think um, we have to first distinguish. Excuse me, one more. <laughs> it's always interesting to be uh, in your home doing these things. Yes, I know, right? <laughs> it's like you, you get you get the family uh, dynamics yeah. as we're presented. So <laughs> the um, I, I, it's an impossibly complex question, which I have tried to penetrate a little bit with with this presentation. I think that probably it's harder work for us to deal with the implicit. There are two parts to the question, the implicit and the explicit. I think the explicit is in front of us. We have people murdering black people in the streets. I mean, that's, you can wrap your mind around that and you can take it upon yourself to do something because that's right out there. The implicit is a slower grind it's um, more damning of ourselves because very, you know, who among us knows anybody who's actually killed anybody? We don't actually, most of us don't experience that even second or third hand. So our work is probably more in the implicit realm, which is very difficult. It's a lot of introspection. It's a lot of conversation um, and a lot of willingness to change, you know, old habits. Uh, but again, I think that we can choose as Jews to derive amazing wisdom, amazing moral, uh, moral uh, orientation from this this three thousand year old tradition, which um, which which is ours to to leverage for everything in the right direction, greater compassion, greater humanity, greater identification with our fellow human being. Yeah. So this is, um, I, I think this is a great way to end it. Um, a, a commenter said, uh, Kevy Kaplan was head of NAACP and he started uh, the RAC. Uh, we, as Reformed Jews, can take um, that which was produced in the 60s and work with, the, with RAC going forward. We don't have to start all over. We can build on our past. And I think you touched on this, but if you'd like to close out with that, because um, we're at the end of our hour. Yeah, I um, I think maybe we differ a little bit in our opinion. I mean, certainly we can. I'm, I'm not saying we should we should get rid of the past. I'm a, I'm an historian after all. I just think that the times are so different, and the location of the Jewish community and the location of the African American community in America today have diverged in in important ways that we need to appreciate. And the divergence doesn't have to be a negative thing. It just needs to be mutually agreed upon where we're coming from so that we can then help. And I just think, I, I, I suspect that the nature of that work, that partnership, is gonna look very different than it did when Abraham Joshua Heschel marched with Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you, Joshua. I appreciate you. You know, I think Thank you're you. awesome, um, and I'm sure our community. Mutual feeling. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure our community uh, communities appreciate you. Um, we want to thank um, USC for um, co-sponsoring this, along with um, Congregation Orami and, um, of course, Valley Outreach Synagogue. Um, we will be doing more joint efforts like this to bring anti-racist education. Um, join us next week for the, for the next part of this discussion. Um, at same time, same place. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.
You have reached the voicemail box of Joshua. 